work on orthobiologics. Uh, Professor Mandeep Dilan is a highly renowned and accomplished expert uh, in the field of orthopedics with extensive experience in trauma, AO, foot and ankle surgery, and the application of biologics in orthopedic surgery. And Professor Dilan has made uh, significant contributions to the field through extensive research publications and presentations. Um, his work has helped advance uh, orthobiologics as well as uh, improve uh, 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 therapies on uh, PRP and uh, uh, treatment of orthopedic conditions. Uh, he has a reputation of developing uh, innovative solutions to improve outcomes for patients. Uh, a short uh, account of uh, his achievement is uh, Chairman uh, Research of AO Trauma Asia Pacific, President of the Indian Biological Orthopedic Society, and is past president of Indian Orthopedic Association, past president of the Arthroplasty, Indian Arthroplasty Association and Foot and Ankle Society, as well as uh, Indian Association of Sports Medicine. He has been uh, president of many national societies, uh, including IOA, Indian Biologics uh, Society, Arthroplasty, as we have uh, said before, and North Zone Indian Orthopedic Association. Uh, he has a special interest in arthroscopy, lower limb arthroplasty, foot and ankle trauma, and sports medicine, in particular cricket. Uh, he is seen with prominent cricket players here. Yeah, and he organizes a course on cricket injuries. Uh, he has written many uh, books, including uh, uh, being editor for AO Manual for Foot and Ankle Trauma. And he has published more than 400 publications. Uh, the topic for today is uh, orthobiologics, and he has written a book on it. He has edited a book on it. And we are fortunate to have uh, Professor Dilan here today to share uh, his insights on uh, orthobiologics. Um, thank you very much, sir, for uh, accepting the invite and uh, uh, coming to uh, talk. Um, Professor Dilan, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Srinivas. Now I think I should share my screen and start my uh, talk before it is... Uh, Sort of, okay, now, how do I get the full? Maximize, maximize from down. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir, we can see yes. it. But okay. you have to I just slide show, to, sir. I want to, yeah, that's what I want to go into the. Uh, go down to the maximized. Yeah, I know, I, I was trying to do that. There's a <laughs> presenter view also. Yes, sir. Let, if I can get that. That's the slideshow. Yes, and uh, okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, orthobiologics and I'm going to be talking about uh, what is the current status and where do we think we will be in the future. I thank you all, especially the Egypt Orthopedic Society for inviting me. And as Dr. Srinivas said, this is this book which you've written three, four years ago, which is available on Amazon. If anybody is interested, it's quite comprehensive. Much of my talk is based on this. I like to dedicate this uh, talk today to Freddie Fu, who died a couple of years ago, and he was a pioneer in knee surgery. And during my development in uh, into orthobiologics, I had a lot of interactions with him uh, physically when he visited us in India and at many international congresses. And he was actually one of the pioneers of orthobiologics with my friend Ellen Mishra and the other guys from all over the American Academy. And we published together along with uh, uh, Mohit Bhandari and all about PRP. And we've done a couple of systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, regarding this issue. However, we have, uh, I have been sort of uh, developing uh, over years and my interest in this subject has been since 2010 when I was associated with uh, Alan Mishra and Nicola Mafuli and we did a couple of international conferences and we went on to work on this much more in India and see and our work has taken us about 15 years to be where we are. Okay, now the question is why orthobiologics and of course what is it? So we'll try and see what we can tell you in these 15 to 20 minutes more because why and what are age old questions and in orthopedics there are so many problems 
which have unanswered questions. Because the issue over here is that most of the time, many orthopedic problems have healing troubles. We are not able to heal our tendons, our bones, even our cartilage at times. And that is why we always talk about orthopedic having two issues. One is tissue stabilization, which we do very well nowadays. We've got great plates, we've got great nails and external fixator devices. But the more important part is tissue healing. And for this, we still feel, even in the 21st century, it is a problem. Now, some conditions have straightforward solutions. You have a deformed, a degenerated knee, you do a knee arthroplasty, patient will do well. There is no great uh, sort of decision making to be done over here. But the challenges come up when you are wanting to stimulate healing. Because even today, some of the conditions of orthopedics have no satisfactory method of healing them 100%. Now, bone healing, we you are able to very easily tackle the mechanical uh, alignment. But the problem since the time of Femister is the bone repair. And so much issues have been done that biological interventions which we are talking about today have been tried for a couple of centuries with the first orthobiological uh, implant being autologous bone graft. And even today we are not so sure what is it out of that bone graft which helps us to get the bone healing. So this problem persists in 2023 also. Therefore we must look at it from a different kind of view. Now let's look at cartilage. This has a unique problem and 200 years ago they said that once you get ulcers in the cartilage, it cannot be repaired. But now we are thinking that we may be in a position to do something for this. And the question comes up is that because of the limited capacity to heal, cartilage doesn't have blood supply. Therefore, the healing potential of the chondrocytes and the regaining the correct positioning of the matrix is variable. So this concern is come up as a, as, a, as a question that can we somehow stimulate the cartilage to heal itself. Now, whenever we talk about cartilage healing, we talk about two things. We got to reconstruct that defect and we've got to make sure that whatever fills up that defect is biologically as near normal cartilage as possible. Soft tissues are another problem. For example, you have tendinopathies or ACL tears and rotator cuffs. These are the common problems in the soft tissues which we, which we have. Again, we have problems of healing in this. And the simple thing for us to do is a, re is a replacement. You just go in and put a graft for the ACL tear and that solves your problem. But actually it doesn't. Because these tendons and these ligaments have significant problems. And the overuse injuries especially need biological repair. So when you have a tendinosis short of a tear or you have tendonitis or so many things, there is a cycle which forms and we need to break that cycle and initiate biological repair. So with this little background about what the problems are in orthopedics, we want to think, do we have an answer to these problems? So we were never sure till about 25 years what we could do. Till people started thinking laterally. And this lateral thinking gave birth to new ideas. And that is why we went back to the simplest of things. We look at our wounds. Over time, these scars fade. The bones unite. The tissues come back to being almost normal. And this power of healing is inherent within all of us. So if we could harness this power of healing and focus it on the bone, tendon and cartilage, it would become a great adjunct to modern orthopedics. So this healing basically needs the correct signals. And this signaling jump starts the healing of tissues. And if we can provide these signals by an innovative use of the body's products or even some synthetic materials, we could be in a position to control the healing processes in the body. So in the 21st century, we are actually looking at tissue bioengineering, which is in a way 
also called as biologic therapy. And this orthopedic biologic, which is a common sense approach for orthopedics and traumatology, is called orthobiologics. If we want to look at a definition for this, it has been defined by some authors that it is basically an inclusion of biology and biochemistry to help develop bone and soft tissue materials that enhance musculoskeletal tissue healing. So that's the thing which is being talked about in the 21st century. So let's see where we have come. Have we really uh, uh, advanced enough to be able to say that we've reached uh, a, a stage where the new focus would be repair and not replace? Because that is something which is a very exciting thing to talk about. Today we have three types of uh, interventions. We have biological stimulants, which will recruit the stem cells to come to an area where healing is required. We can add matrices, which provide the framework onto which these cells would come back and produce tissue. Or we have the mesenchymal stem cells themselves, which could provide any kind of potential, bone, cartilage, even tendon. So these are the various categories which we can look at broadly. Now, what has changed is the methods of delivery of these biological substances. In the last 20 years, so many things have been coming in like newer methods of growth factor delivery. And if you want to classify the progression of orthobiologics, a simplistic classification, which we have published in our book also, is it all started with hyaluronic acid. 30 years ago, this was the first generation of orthobiologics. Then came a big blast of platelet-rich plasma, which was the first autologous form of orthobiologics. And then it went on to various things with the bone marrow concentrate in the third generation and adipose-derived tissues in the fourth generation. Platelet-rich plasma was something which I started working with. Now, it seems to work in many, many conditions and we worked on many conditions in the last 20 years almost. It, we started in 2008 and much before that, PRP was actually discovered by Ross, who said that whenever you add platelets and calcium or a platelet extract, in certain situations, the mitogenic activities of these cells increased. So they found that the platelets when they break down or they are activated by calcium, have an advantage and they push mitogenic activities. Now, further work was done and inside the platelets, certain growth factors were discovered. PDGF and uh, TGF, uh, beta, IGF, 1, all of them were discovered by various authors over the next 15, 20 years, and they have tried to isolate them from the platelets over time. Now, currently, approximately 600 growth factors have been identified in PRP. Now, which one does what, we are not very sure, but we know there are many growth factors in this concentrated platelet-rich plasma. You do a Google search today for the word PRP, you will get 7 million results. And this search by me was done about two years ago. Now you will probably get 10 million. That's the interest and the utility of PRP in varying fields of medicines. Now in orthopedics, we have many applications and the evidence for this is evolving. And if you look at the PubMed, the huge volume of publications, it is doubling or tripling every year. So the biologic publications have come into the orthopedic mainstream. It all started with tennis elbow. You know, many, many years ago, I think it's now 15 years ago, the most influential article on orthobiologics was the work of Alan Mishra from Stanford University, who gave some of the big stars of the Super Bowl these injections. And then it went on to being published in various, various journals. And the literature on PRP in tennis elbow came up with a bang. So many people published. We did a randomized control trial in 2015. And we found that the scores using PRP 
were better than those with Abubiba cane group. Now we didn't say that they were excellent, but they were significantly better. On the other hand, my friend Mikkala Mafuli put a spoke in the wheel. He said that whenever you talk about tendon healing with platelet rich plasma, they may have a positive effect, but we were never sure about how we could use it and how we can optimize the use of this. In Echelis tendinopathy, on the other hand, there was no improvement with PRP. So people stopped using it in chronic Achilles tendinopathy and in plantar fasciitis. This great study from Egypt about 2012 talked about the way it improves the plantar fascia thickness, but it doesn't alter the biomechanics and definitely it's safe. So we also published a similar study with Dr. Vijay Shetty and myself, and we found that there is some benefit of PRP in plantar fascia. However, the data was evaluated by the Mac Master University Group, and now this is 20, 10 years ago. And at that time, the PRP evidence was considered to be uncertain. The problem was each one, each group of researchers was using a different protocol, a different evaluation method, and the standardization of these protocols was never being done properly. For me, most of my work on PRP started on knee osteoarthritis. We started projects in 2008 and we published a study in 2013, which has become perhaps the most cited PRP publication from around the world. We've got 800 plus citations in the last 10 years. And now we realize that there are so many things we can do to a simple PRP where we could help improve the results. And this is coming up because of a better understanding. Now, can we add some biomaterials to PRP? And these could be things like a gelatin hydrogel or a chitrosan, which keeps the PRP in the position for a longer period of time so that the effect of the growth factors goes on for a long time. So they have a prolonged and sustained release of growth factors. And this could be indicated in wound healing, bone defects, knee osteoarthritis. And there were a couple of studies talking about this. They talked about gelatin, hydrogel, microspheres, etc. And we did it in guinea pigs also. In our institute, we tried to inject chitosan at room temperature using allogenic PRP. And we found that there was an improvement at the mean total articular cartilage score. But its only advantage seems to be that it, in, it sort of exerts a good anti-inflammatory effect in the short term. But we were not successful in getting long-term results. So this is still experimental at best. The next question about PRP is, are all the preparations the same? Which is the kind of PRP which we should use? Because there are so many things which come into preparation of PRP. You, could you use the Buffy coat versus the plasma-based? Should the PRP be WBC rich or WBC poor? Should you spin it single time or should you spin it two times and get a better concentrate? So all of this is because of the fact that people evaluated PRP and found that all PRP products are not the same. So what came out of this was this classification by Alan Mishra. So he's classified, he calls it the sports medicine classification of platelet rich plasma and he's talking about three things whether the white blood cells are increased or have they been taken out? Do you need activation or you do not need activation? And what is the platelet concentration? Uh, concentration Five times the baseline or less than five times. So he's classified them into four types and depends upon the situation. You can use the PRP according to that. What we have researching recently is what we call as a super dose. That means instead of injecting 4 ml into the knee, we are injecting 8 ml because the way we do it in our, with our blood bank, we get much more PRP than the conventional machines. The next question, does the PRP need activation? Because most of the times previously, this was always done. And many of these uh, 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 PRPs were uh, uh, activated by adding calcium oxalate or something to them. So there are various exogenous uh, uh, activators. 
But when you inject PRP into muscles and tendons, you can get something called as an endogenous activation. So you don't, if you're injecting it into a joint where there is no muscle breakdown, you need an exogenous activator. So we did a study and we found that there was no difference in outcomes when we did looked at matched groups in knee osteoarthritis with or without activators. So the activator actually is a waste of time. But the superdose which we used has a longer effect. So the WOMAX scores were showing a continuing improvement when we were using 8 ml of the PRP rather than this. Now moving on from uh, uh, PRP, we come to the so-called much more interesting cellular therapy. And cellular therapy is a key part of orthopedics because orthobiologics in cartilage lesions would involve cellular therapy. Now we all know that the cartilage repair capability comes down. So we can do some things like subchondral abrasion, microfracture has been done for a long time to get blood there so that there is a healing capacity. Now we have this assisted repair which is cell based and we also have the autologous chondrocyte implantations. All of these are variations of cell based healing of cartilage lesions. The ACI was started many many years ago i think it's almost 30 years ago when mats bitberg started working on, on this and it has now taken root it is known as a good method of healing cartilage but what has changed now is now we probably have something like chondrocyte cell sheets you can culture the chondrocytes on sheets and implant these sheets after you've corrected the alignments and you've filled up the defect so and with layering of chondrocyte sheets the healing of the cartilage is that much better so what is happening is actually tissue engineering so orthobiologics is a lot of these tissue engineering like this example of a synthetic material with autogenous uh, autogenous uh, materials so if you have a meniscus tear you can put in a scaffold matrix and then add some cells and PRP to this and the tissue will regenerate from the periphery into this and you will get nearly uh, uh, tissue which is near to meniscus tissue and will last a long time. The key point over here which becomes a medical legal issue is the stem cells because you can get stem cells from various parts of the body and you can apply them to various uh, parts of the body also. So, so much has been written about it and it is the, uh, sort of attracting huge financial investment because this is supposed to be the last frontier of orthopedics biological treatment, not only orthopedics, every uh, specialty of medicine is looking at this. In orthopedics, the work started with spinal cord injury and osteoarthritis and in our institute we've done a lot of work on AVN of the femoral head but it's now going on to genetic conditions like osteogenesis imperfecta. We all know how the stem cell can start as a totipotent cell, become a multipotent cell and then become any type of body tissue and it is just this that we want to harvest. Even today, Bone marrow is the commonest source of stem cells. It's perhaps called the fountain of youth. But what is happening over time is that we realize that although it is easy to harvest from the eli crest, it is cheap. The fraction of stem cells as a total of the cells is very low. And if you have aged patients, then you may not get enough stem cells. That's why people are thinking at other options like adipose derived stem cell. And this was a big debate when Christopher Reeve was recovering from his quadriplegia. So the issue is that we are now shifting from getting the stem cells from bone to getting it from fat tissues. And this is where the big fight is. Fat stem cells versus bone marrow stem cells, which is better and why? Time magazine actually called fat stem cell extraction as one of the best inventions of the year. And that is how we now know that the, if you can very easily get stem cells from fat tissues and this easy and cheap way of getting it done. We have also evolved the extraction methods. 
and concentration techniques and these are going to give us that much better cellular capacities as than we had before. The cell culture and cultivation techniques are also improving. They are put into a culture medium and then they have then they are also applied back. And I was part of a study here in India with an autologous osteoblast implantation, which is called Osro. And this is now available uh, in our country along with the chondron and Osron that you can culture the chondroblast or the osteoblast and then put it back in certain conditions in the body. And this is how it's done. You biopsy, you culture, you implant and you get regenerated bone. Now, with all these things, the question being asked is, what next for stem cells and regenerative medicines? Now, we are heading into a different kind of uh, growth potential. For example, in many surgical branches, regenerative medicine is being talked about because we may be talking about restoring organs not transplanting organs. Now that is just something which we are thinking about. I'm not so sure it's happening today. But there are people who are talking about regenerative medicine replacing transplant medicine. So that's possible in the future also. Now one little thing I'll talk to talk about is will ACL repair replace ACL reconstruction which is called as a bio-enhanced ACL repair. And I'll give you a couple of examples of some publications about 10 years ago. Murray et al. started working on primary ACL repair in dogs. They had a biological scaffold which they applied with a cell enhancement which allows cell invasion and they found that they had significant strength in these ACL repairs. We tried to work on this in guinea pig cultures. We tried to stimulate the with platelet rich plasma to see, but this was a preliminary work and we never take, took it forward. However, bone to bone healing after fixing with an internal splint and adding orthobiologic products has worked in some hands. Again, Murray published in Arthroscopy about enhancing the biology of ACL repair. The bio scaffolds could work, little evidence about hyaluron or PRP and stem cell enhanced repair. But this example, which are all, uh, which are uh, public, uh, sort of images from a publication by Steve Jordan, ACL autograft was wrapped in a collagen matrix and then implanted and then injected with VMAC. And the MRI shows that the ACL which is formed is almost like that of normal and it is even better than the ones in which all this was not done. So the future folks of medicine may be combinations used to stimulate healing. So we may be maybe 5, 10, 15 years down the line be able to teach the body how to rebuild these tissues and maybe how to build organs also. Now cartilage healing, we are already using combinations and the combinations are osteochondroconductive scaffolds, osteochondroinductive signals and the precursor cells and the scaffold fixation method. So we are already using these combinations in cartilage healings. But before I sort of go into the last few slides, we cannot stop without talking about genetic therapy. And gene therapy is something which is being used for, for cartilage engineering because there are people have now realized that the same gene that promotes healing after cartilage damage also protects against osteoarthritis. So if we can harness this gene, we can work for many, many more things. We can even manipulate the cells after gene therapy to produce more BMP. So this may be helpful in fracture healing. So what happens is we transfer the DNA to the cells and the, uh, and the carrier can be a virus or a stem cell and then this is put back into the target area. Now this is better than a single shot and this is work on bone healing better than a single shot of BMP because these genetically altered cells can go on producing BMP for a long time. First method is cells are harvested they are transfer is done outside and then they are re-implanted and the second method is direct application of the gene therapy vector where you want the healing to go in. Again, even in gene therapy, 
combinations may be that much better. We worked on some genetic review publications. We looked at genetic predispositions and we look identify the polymorphisms in different collagens which could help, but I'm not going to go into the details of this. So ladies and gentlemen, before I end, where do we stand today? Well, very honestly, the future of orthobiologics may be combination therapy. It may not be stem cell or PRP or a scaffold alone. And in, in the book, which I've talked about, there are many chapters which are discussing recent advantage and all of them recent have been a different thing for a different thing. But the next big question is ethics. Because there are so many ethical implications of regenerative medicine that we have to be very careful when we are using it. Because the market is so big, the finances involved are so much that the finances often drive clinical application. I'm sure it's your true for you also when you sit in your OPDs because the realities of the so-called orthopedic market are very simple. Many surgeons know very little about orthobiologics, but many surgeons are desperate for anything that could give them a better result than their competition. And some surgeons would try anything to get a competitive edge over the others. This is a fact. This is the truth in India. I do not know whether it is the truth in India. So if all this is there, then the producer comes to you with a product with limited research and inadequate developments and you implement it without understanding it could lead to problem. And that is why regulatory bodies are stepping in. The FDA classifies orthobiologics as devices, whereas we orthopedic surgeons don't think of them as devices. They, we just think of them as tissues. So that's why this is happening. And remember, technologies will change in the future. But Technology is neutral. It's neither good nor is it evil. It is up to us to apply them with empathy and compassion. So we must be sure about what we are doing before we do. So where are we heading, ladies and gentlemen? Much of the cutting edge research we often don't comprehend. And we just want to jump onto the bandwagon without sufficient patient data. Even with some experimental evidence, the manufacturers convince us, please go and do it. And this is why regulation is now becoming strict. In my country, it is very, very strict. And this is, these regulations are a big issue, especially in cell-based therapies, because different countries have different uh, regulations. In Brazil, because of religious issues, they don't even allow many of these stem-based cell therapy. But if you look at the stem cell-based therapies, there are three categories which are regulated differently. And what I mean by that is these categories come upon on the degree of manipulation of the cells. If you've done very little manipulation and the cell stem cells are from your body, you don't need too much approval. But if they are allogenic or if they are coming with major manipulation like genetic alterations, then you need approvals, you need clinical trials and you need institutional ethical committee clearance before you can use them. So take my advice, stay out of trouble, understand the patient, the indications, be clear about the procedure you plan. Don't try to be the first one to do it. I did PRP first, I did, that's not going to help you in the long run. But remember, it may not be just one therapy, but a combination of therapies, which may be the way to go in the future. And let's see where the future takes us. I thank you for your time and a patient here. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor Mandeep, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for accepting the invite to come to this uh, forum. And uh, your insights into the latest development in this field are invaluable. And I'm sure uh, your talk has inspired uh, many attendees, uh, including myself, to explore uh, the future of orthobiologics. Once again, thank you very much, sir, uh, for uh, giving the talk. So, um, so we have. Uh, Dr. Sanivas, I have a question, please, to Dr. Mandeep, if you allow me, please. Yes, please. Professor Mandeep, uh, we use PRP in many situations in soft tissue, such as ACL repair and reconstruction, in cartilage repair, in osteochondral defects, and in 
meniscal sutures, for example, and meniscal repair, and in wool healing. From your long experience, sir, uh, the best results obtained with soft tissues, with cartilage, or with bone uh, healing induction? Well, I would say the best results are in the soft tissues. Soft tissues. Because yes. there is a lot of vascularity. Maybe in cartilage, not so much, except for the peripheral meniscus cartilage. We've had some good results with suturing the meniscus and using them in meniscal cysts. But the use with an added advantage in ACLs is evolving. Now we get so many cases we have an ACL sprain and get a mix or degeneration of the ACL. They come with pain. They don't come with instability. And here a PRP injection would help them that ACL to regenerate. And uh, we have we, we've been excited to some extent about knee osteoarthritis also, PRP. But the problem is, by the time the patient comes to us, it is too late for us to try PRP. The PRP needs to be started in the stages one and two, when the patient really doesn't bother about getting any sort of these injection. They come to you when they're just ripe for knee replacement and then they want the magic of PRP or something else. So if you do it in the right uh, sort of uh, time, you must uh, explain to the patient that I am not reversing your changes. I am perhaps getting your own body to heal itself. And if there is any age changing thing involved, we can't do that. And we can buy you time, then it's a good, good thing. Yes, can I ask you? Okay. Please, please. Uh, I no, read some, some, some papers, sir. Uh, I'm an arthroplasty surgeon, actually. Uh, I read some papers in cementless uh, fixation, cementless total hip and knee. They tried to use the PRP to facilitate the healing of uh, and the uh, bone uh, in the, yeah. and in growth. Yeah. Uh, do you believe in this, sir? There's not enough evidence. Sir. I mean, it, there's not enough evidence to show that uh, even in the bone to bone healing, I think Dr. Corona will be talking about non unions. Uh, it helps. But then it's not only PRP, there need to be so many combinations of things which work together. You need to have the good scaffold, good stem cells. PRP is just a signal. It signals your body. The growth factors are signaling elements. They are not magic. They will just signal your body to work. So if your body systems are not working, like in debilitated patients, etc., I'm not so sure it's going to be that helpful. Thank you for your lectures. And uh, I am happy that you are highlighting that uh, with the regenerative medicine is uh, the future. And I think we have to stress about this regenerative medicine. It's better than replacement, replacement therapy or surgery. Because I think we, we, we will face a lot of trouble with the, the industry about yes. this. And I think we, we need uh, somebody who has um, supporting or um, this research, uh, uh, research and development. I think regenerative medicine is better, better, better than if you are replacing the, the injured uh, part, like yes. ACL, like uh, joint replacement. Uh, so I uh, um, I am happy that you are highlighting about the regenerative medicine. Thank you for your lectures. Thank you so much for a patient hearing, sir. And I like the comments which you have given. Very, very helpful. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Sinivas, you have raised your hand, sir. Sir, just uh, one query. Uh, regarding, uh, I mean, as orthopedic surgeons, we have been using bone grafting uh, for so many years. And uh, that contains uh, uh, stem cells. But the, pro the main problem issue is concentrating these uh, yeah. and, and using stem cells separately as, as uh, different lines. Uh, where do you see the future of uh, uh, stem cells in terms of regulations? Um, uh, do you think uh, regulations are going to get easier for stem cells in the future? Sir, it all depends on the evidence which we doctors present. Right now in India, there are three categories. I just told you, I think I showed a slide also. So it depends also on when we, stem cell is a very, very wide uh, term. It is how those stem cells are manipulated, number one. Number two, whether the stem cells belong to you or if they are coming from other, another source, because there is so many things which can come in. And what kind of genetic manipulation are you doing? If you are not doing any genetic manipulation, it is easier to do them how you have cultured them or have mm -hmm. are, or are you just doing a minimal manipulation now bone grafting is the least manipulative procedure of orthobiologics 
but you don't have the stem cells in the concentration that you want. BMAC is slightly more advanced than that. You take their like crest cells and you concentrate them and you put it back in things like avascular necrosis or even in bone healing. So it's the variations of the intervention will depend because then you can start doing anything and have no regulation. The regulatory authorities come into play when you are fiddling with the stem cells to a larger extent. Then you have to, the medical fraternity has to show the proof that okay, we are doing this and it is a great advantage because it adds to the cost, it adds to the, the complication rate, you could get an infection, you could get a problem. So the regulatory authority right now is also evolving in their own understanding of what the doctors are doing. When PRP came in, when high, nobody bothered, you could do what you wanted with PRP. Now people are realizing that there are problems coming up because untrained people may be also starting to use it and then you get a problem. Sir, at the moment, PRP and BMAC can be used uh, without yeah. uh, regulations, but stem cells cannot be used. Uh, they, they can be used only under experimental conditions. Uh, why are stem cells, uh, why, how can they be dangerous? Uh, what complications? Well, they have the potential for malignant change also. There is a problem of malignant change. But uh, and the more you manipulate these cells, you don't know where they go wrong. Your cancer in your own body is your own cell gone wrong. So that is where the, so unless there is evidence, there is a big uh, sort of control on all of this. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mandeep. We have, uh, we know that you have uh, uh, another, uh, another uh, time you have, you will be with us uh, in the next future, sir. And we thank you so much for being with us, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. Have thank a good you, night. Sir. See you, sir. Night. Either in yeah. Cairo or online. See you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mandeep, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sir Nivas, if you allow me to introduce uh, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Baha Corona. Professor Baha Corona uh, is a professor of orthopedic surgery in Al Azhar University and one of the administrative board of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association and one of the eminent stars of orthopedic surgery in Egypt. Professor Baha will speak about uh, another talk which is more or less similar to the talk of Professor Mandeep. Uh, Professor Baha will speak about the principles of non-union and how to manage it. Professor Baha. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Just uh, allow me to yes, sir. It's clear, thank sir. you very much for uh, inviting me and uh, uh, to part for uh, and sharing for this orthopedic uh, uh, webinar uh, uh, conjoined between uh, Egypt, Egypt and India, one of the oldest uh, country and with uh, good civilization and. Uh, uh, all the people we uh, we have uh, same uh, uh, cultures, the same uh, uh, futures, and uh, we have uh, sharing many things with each, with each other. Okay, this uh, might talk about fracture uh, fracture non unions or principle and management of non union. This is uh, my acknowledgement for, and uh, this is my outline. I am going to speak about definition of epidemiology, etiology, evaluation, classification and treatment principle stabilization of biology. The instance of non-union is uh, running with, uh, up to 10% in the long bone fracture. And there is a risk depend, uh, upon the injury, type of injury, type of the bone, type of the patient, and also the type of the treatment. For the fracture healing, we have three phases, which is inflammatory phase, repair phase, and the remodeling phase. And this is uh, um, going with different time and in different phases until complete healing. So back in times table for fracture healing uh, is different upper limb from the lower limb with a, a colors visibility about two weeks, union about two, six weeks in upper limb, 12 weeks in the lower limb, consolidation eight weeks in the upper limb, about 16 weeks in lower limb. So what is the condition for adequate bone healing? Uh, we need a good reduction. We need a uh, contact between the fragment and also with strict mobilization. And also we need an anatomical reduction of the articular fracture and good alignment with the stable osteosynthesis 
and with absolute aseptic. So the, uh, the biological of the bone healing, it, uh, the healing can be occurred by two methods, either primary bone healing or secondary bone healing. Primary bone healing means that you need an absolute stability. For the secondary bone healing, you need a relative stability. So for the fracture, if the fracture passes uh, for healing, it's okay. But if, the, if uh, some complication can be occurred in the fracture, like delayed union, mal union, joint stiffness, abascal necrosis, osteoarthritis, joint stability, and also the non-union, and this is our talk today. So uh, what is the, what is the non-union or non-union fracture? Fracture non-union is described as a failure of normal fracture healing process. Solid bone healing will not occur without further treatment or intervention. This is the same thing. But there is other definition, reasonable abrupt treat, like the fracture that is not currently healed and is not going to heal. This is the non-union. The late union means that the fracture that requires more time than usually to heal and show healing progress over time. There is a definition that has been uh, proposed by FDA in 1986. Nine units of fracture that uh, minimum nine months post occurrence and healed and has not shown radiological progression for three months. But this can be uh, pragmatic, like the, we need a, a prolonged mobility, narcotic abuse, and the provision and or emotional impairment for this patient. So the definition of pragmatic care is a non-unit fracture that has no potential to heal without further intervention. This is a, a definition. So what, is the, what are the type of non-unit of the fractures? We have uh, uh, four types, which is uh, classified into hypertrophic, oligotrophic, atrophic, vascular, and pseudoarthrosis. This, uh, this um, uh, classification based on the vascularity, which has been studied by Strachan 88 scanning uh, into hypertrophic, oligotrophic, and atrophic. So hypertrophic types, this means that the fracture has good vascularity with colorless formation present in the X-ray. And we have two types, elephant type and the elephant foot type. And here there is an abundant colors. Uh, you can see it in the X-ray. And we have horse hoof, and here this abundant colors formation. So we have uh, in hypertrophic type, we have abundant colors. We have, a, uh, we have a, uh, this is due to adequate blood supply, but there is insufficient stability. Oligohypertrophic, which is, is uh, some or minimum colors on the X-ray, there is adequate blood supply, but due to lack of reduction or lack of contact between the bone, leading to the less formation of the colors. So, uh, noted in aggressive healing response, but not completely voiding of biologic activity. Vascularity is present on the bone scan. Atrophic type, it is uh, there is no colors at all, inadequate blood supply due to inadequate blood supply of the bone, and there, there is deficiency in biology, and there is a schema or cold on the bone scan. There is no enough biology, lack, likely needed biological favorable solution. We have um, uh, the fourth type, which is uh, called the pseudoarthrosis. It typically has adequate vascularity, but there is an excessive motion and excessive instability at the fracture site. And there is, uh, there is, they, will need it, uh, they will lead to form a false joint forming over a significant time. You know, there is a suspension of biology, but so much mechanical instability that the body is uh, tricked into thinking there should there be a joint there. And also the pseudoarthrosis has been sub, uh, subclassified into fibrous pseudoarthrosis, elephant food, uh, pseudoarthrosis, minimum colors, limb pseudoarthrosis, neurosthrosis, and atrophic pseudoarthrosis. So uh, Betty came with uh, this classification. He uh, classified the uh, non-unit into type A and type B. E. Type A, if there is uh, less than one centimeter, uh, one centimeter bone loss, and the type B, which is there is more than one centimeter bone loss. And he added that they can be further classified based on the deformity present or not and the shortening present or not. So what is the cause of non-union of the fractures? The cause of non-union or the etiology of non-union can be divided into biological, 
or mechanical or patient factor or injury factor or multifactorial. So the etiology of non union also can be also or host factor, which we mentioned before as a patient factor, fracture or injury factor, and the initial treatment and the complication factor infections. So local risk factor like open fracture, high energy fracture with bone devitalization, severe associated soft tissue injury, bone loss and infection. Systemic risk factors like malnutrition, smoking, non-steroidal and systemic medical condition. So this is a bio, uh, biomechanical of non-union. Important factor is biological and the mechanical environment present or absent of infection. Is this uh, non-union is septic or aseptic? The vascularity of the fracture, stability of the fracture, deformity, and which bone has been involved with. This is a patient factor, injury factor, surgical factor, and we mentioned in the next slide. So the etiology of non-union host factor or the patient factor. Is this patient smoking? So they, there will be a liability for non-union. Hormonal and related, like the patient who is uh, suffering from comorbidity, like diabetes, thyroid, parathyroid disorder, testosterone, and uh, deficiency of calcium and phosphorus. Also, malnutrition, very important uh, part in, uh, in uh, inducing in, uh, non-union. Medication like steroid or chemotherapy or immunosuppressive. Bone quality and the vascular status and the balance, it, uh, balance you know, compliance with of the patient with the uh, type of the treatment. Smoking has been this uh, is being mentioned, and uh, there is uh, uh, they have effect on the bone, like decrease the peripheral ox oxygen tension, dampening the peripheral blood flow, and will document difficulty in the wound healing in patient who smoking. And this is a um, study by Adam who mentioned that about the difference between the smoker and the non-smoker about time of healing, and you can find that. The healing time is 32 weeks, and in non smoking, about 28 weeks. What about the uh, comorbidities like diabetes and neuropathy? The best study is the ankle and pilot fracture and the complicated diabetes disease with end organ disease, neuropathic BVD, and uh, renal dysfunction. Malnutrition, adequate protein and energy is required for wound healing if you don't have. Adequate to retain this will be interfered with uh, uh, the bone healing. Majority of the organ phase of the bone is a protein. So screening tests are very important. We are preparing for the patient. You see, you have to, you have to measure the serum album and also total leukocyte count. Also, the iatrogenic, uh, like poor reduction, unstable fixation, and poor bone devitalization uh, during surgery. Iatrogenic stripping, uh, uh, this will lead to the devitalization of the tough, uh, soft tissues and also leading to limited healing potential and implant failure. Occasionally required the resection and the reconstruction period to healing. What about the fracture and the injury factor? The type of the fracture, high energy, uh, high energy injury, fracture mechanism, motor vehicle look different from falling from a standing. Open or closed fracture is different in the management and leading to non-union. Is the fracture affecting the cortical or cancerous bone? And also the presence of bone loss and also soft tissue injury and the bone involving and anatomical location. So also the, the fracture pattern, what we call the, uh, the fracture personality. Fracture pattern in high energy, like comminution, bone loss or segmental, have a high degree of soft tissues and the bone ischemia. Accurate, uh, uh, acute compartmental syndrome can be leading to um, uh, uh, the delayed union or non-union uh, uh, soft tissues. Traumatic soft tissue disruption, the risk of non-union increases with open fracture. More severe open fracture in the Castello type two versus type one have a high risk of non-union. And uh, uh, there is a um, um, classification for the soft tissue classification. Not all high energy fracture are open fracture, but soft tissue import, uh, envelope very important in uh, management of the fracture. So this is classification grade from grade one for grade zero soft tissue damage is absent or negligible. Grade two, the superficial abrasion or contusion, deep uh, grade three, uh, two, deep contaminated abrasion associated with localized 
the skin and the muscle contusion from dialectoroma and grade three in the skin extensively contused or crushed. So this is a closed injury or soft tissue injury can be a, a, a part of uh, inducing non-union. So it's very important to remember that revascularization of ischemic bone fragment in the fracture is derivative from the soft tissues. So uh, if the soft tissues like skin, muscle, adipose is ischemic, it must first recover period to revascularization of bone. So the bone healing will be affected. What about the surgeon and the surgical factor? Very important. But like a patient, uh, the surgeon, he, he do an operation in adequate reduction can be uh, reducing or predisposing to non-union. In adequate stabilization, distraction as a fracture site, excessive soft tissue stripping, uh, removal of the osteum and the soft tissue around the bone, improper or unstable fixation, uh, we have an absolute uh, stability and relative stability. Also, the condition in absolute, uh, absolute instability, if you have a gap more than allowable uh, type, this will uh, produce uh, non-union. Also, the non-union under condition of relative stability, sufficient stability is not in, impaired as a soft callus stage to allow for mineralization of the chondroid matrix. Instability prevent bringing a bone formation despite biological activity. What about the initial treatment of a, you have you receive the patient and starting the treatment? This is a surgical factor. Nanyun may be occur after completely ap ap appropriate treatment of the fracture and after less than appropriate treatment. Uh, was appropriate management performed initially, like operative or non-operative? Was the stability achieved initially uh, in the treatment? Also consider the bone and the anatomical location like shaft or metaphysia, and also look for the patient host state and the compliance with the care. Also, the initial treatment factor after operative treatment, you do an operation, but the patient not uh, uh, following the instruction, was appropriate implant and the technique employed or not, like fixation strategy, uh, relatively or absolute stability, direct or indirect reduction, implant size, length, number of the screws, looking or versus con conventional, looking of a uh, uh, location of incision and the sign of wound dissections. Also for the initial treatment, uh, is it current constructed uh, to be flexible or too stiff, implanted too short in some cases like uh, doing less screws, bridging plating of simple pattern with lack of compression. Uh, why did the current treatment fail understanding the mode of failure? Also, the anatomical location of the fracture, we have some, some area of skeleton are at risk for non-union due to an anatomical vascularity consideration, like proximal fifth metacarpal, femoral neck, and the carpal scaphoid, and the distal end of the tibia. Open diaphyseal tibial fracture are the classical example with high rate of non-union throughout the iterations. Also, the presence of infection, it is very important to consider the infection as a part of a non-union uh, of all prognostic, uh, prognostic factors in the tibial fracture care that employing the worst prognosis with infection. Uh, well, uh, the infection can be, may, may be obviously or subclinic. So obvious infection, if you have an open draining wound, erythema, any adequate soft tissues cover, this you have to consider it as an infection and it is obviously, but sometimes the subclinical is more difficult to do diagnosis. So you have to have a high index of suspicions like ESR, serial activity may be in indicated infection and provide baseline value for, for the follow uh, after debridement and antibiotic therapy. And uh, this is an example. Also, also put in your mind that if you have a non-union, you should be considered infected until proved otherwise. So you have to put it this in your mind. If you have a non-union non fracture, consider it is the, so in the first management, excluding infection first. Dramatic association between the deep infection and the non-union. Debridement and also this needed debridement also, also need debridement. Multiple culture identification of the bacteria is very important. Infection disease consultation is helpful. Infected bone requires stability to resolve the infection. 
Well, how to diagnose this infection of an infected lung unit? It can be easily by technician 99 diphosphonate lead or gall uh, gallium uh, 67 saturated accumulated as a site of inflammation, not a specific sequential technician and gallium scanograph. What about the more specific? It is labeled leukocyte scan infected uh, in the diagnosis of infected lung unit, good with accurate uh, with acute osteomyelitis, but less effective in diagnosis of chronic and subacute bone infection. It helps the sensitivity to about 86%, and specificity about 86%. What about the MRI? MRI helpful for uh, there will be an abnormal bone marrow uh, with the increased signal at the T2 and low signal on the T1. Can identify and follow the sinus tract and the, the presence of sequester. So now we are coming for the, the diagnosis. So we have two options. We have two uh, part. Part of diagnosis of non-union and part for patient evaluation after your diagnosis is uh, uh, non So for diagnosis, you have to know about the history, clinical and neurological. For patient evaluation, you need to know the uh, general, local and radiological uh, evaluation. So diagnosis, uh, you have to put in your mind, suspected when uh, non-union non has been diagnosed when suspected when what? Resistant of pain as a fracture site, no physiological motion as a fracture, uh, uh, non-physiological non motion as a fracture site, progressive deformity, no radiographical evidence of healing and uh, losing of the implant. So this is a symptom of uh, the non-union. All those patients complaining either by swelling, pain, tenderness, instability, limb or joint deformity, difficult bear, uh, bear, uh, wait, bear waiting, wait, waiting, and maybe combined of the above. For the history, then go for a physical examination and the medical history. This physical examination look for the patient for limb instability or stable, limb alignment and delancing if there is a deformity in lung, condition of the soft tissue involved around the uh, fracture site, and also uh, assist the neurovascular examination. Diagnosis is very important, always based on radiography. So the follow-up radiography is very important. Plain X-ray, very important. And uh, um, two, uh, we have to take an, in two views, the two joint above, two joint and the two views. Rule of two, CT are very helpful to, to de detect the gap. Uh, so the radi uh, radiological evaluation, is, uh, the standard radiography are often diagnostic. 45 degrees oblique film can increase the diagnostic accuracy despite additional projected uh, potential for false positive result for fracture healing remain. So also clinical diagnosis can be by motion film or about the stability obtaining with a stress film. And this stress film can be uh, when you uh, applied an uh, uh, weight bearing like a virus. If uh, the patient going for virus uh, deformity or valgus deformity, this is indicated of uh, non-union. Also, computer tomography it is a very helpful tools and modality to uh, clarity uh, when the implant or the fracture obliquely project doubt. Patient evaluation, and when you have a patient who is going for, uh, and you diagnose that, uh, for uh, you have diagnosed him as a non-union, and this is the patient you are going for, uh, for surgical, and you have to prepare him. So the patient evaluation, also starting by history of the injury, and the period of the treatment, medical history, and the comorbidity uh, for this patient, physical examination, including deformity, imaging modalities and the patient, uh, what the patient needs and the goal of the treatment and expectation of this patient. So the patient evaluation is starting by the history. Uh, the date, the number of uh, uh, original injury, is it high or low energy, open or closed, number of period surgery, if it has one surgery, two surgery or more than, history of drainage or wound healing difficulties, period of infection, written timeline uh, in complex cases, current symptoms of this patient and ability to walk or performing active daily living. Also, the patient comorbidity, medical history, they ask about diabetes, endocrinopathies, 
physiological age and comorbidity, also about heart disease, also ask about nutrition and smoking, medication, ambulatory and function stated uh, now and period to the original injuries. Also, it is uh, uh, a physical, when you have uh, finished this, you have to go for physical examination. This look for the, the limb, the apparent of the limb is the, the color changes, skin quality, period, uh, period, of, uh, period of incision, the skin graft, erythema and drainage. Also, uh, uh, examine the joint above and joint below, range of motion of all the joint uh, affected, pain, location, and the contributing factor, strengthening the ability to bear weight, vascular status, and sensation distal to the fracture site, and also assist the deformity. This is the evaluation you have to be putting in your mind. Soft tissue envelope, infection present or not, joint contracture present or not, nerve function, vascularity, location and size of the defect, the hardware was uh, used, and the general history of the host and the psychosocial uh, resource of this patient. So imaging, if you have this patient and you diagnose this and you are not happy about the condition, you do an, some imaging. Any injury-related imaging available, you have to study it again, plain film, and CT scan. Serial plane radiography from the injury to the, to the present are extremely helpful, hard to get. So, some current imaging, like the also goner X-ray, may be helpful. Oblique may be helpful for radiography diagnosis of non-union. CT can be helpful, but metal artifact can make difficult. Radiographic and union scales for the typical rust seems reliable. Uh, for assessment of uh, healing. So patient information, imaging tomography, the CT and the MRI have a replacement in linear tomography, consider digital tomography if available to assist the non-union. Also the goal of an expectation, you have to discuss with the, the, your patient, what are the patient goal and the need? Is, uh, is his uh, householding ambulation or marathon runner? Pain relief expectation for this patient. Also, ask uh, explain to him the range of motion expectation. But long standing non union may have a stiff adjacent joint. Uh, risk for neurovascular structure like radial nerve in the humeral non union can be occurred. So, I have to explain this for the patient. The treatment now we have uh, three lines of treatment medical treatment, non operative treatment. Operative. Medical treatment, you have to consider about the traditional nutritional condition. Put the patient in optimum medical condition. This is a medical treatment. So the non-operative treatment, it can be divided into electromagnetic, which is uh, and ultrasonography, but like direct current inducing co uh, coupling and uh, capacity coupling ultrasonography. So the rule of non-operative modalities. Is it helpful? Yes, they, they all have clinical evidence to support the effectiveness of these modalities. Few comparative study between the modalities has been mentioned in the literature. Few comparative study between non-operative and operative method. Best is treated for hypertrophic non-union, but it's not uh, applicable for atrophic non-union. Does, uh, does nothing to correct the deformity if a patient has uh, deformity. The non-operative treatment has no rules to correct this deformity. So we have electric stimulation, by applied mechanical stress in the wound generating electrical potential. In the compression size, there will be electronegative potential. This is uh, help for bone formation. In the tension size, they have an electropositive potential. This will lead to bone resorption. Basic science just suggests that electric stimulation uh, upregulating the TFG, uh, TGF, B and the B, uh, B and B, a suggestive osteoinduction. We have another modalities with electro uh, bone growth stimulating, and we have three modalities, either in, in, inside the skin, outside, and uh, combined. Direct current with the implantation of cathode in the bone and the anode in the skin, and direct uh, coupling, layer pulse, electromagnetic field with devices on the skin, and the capitative coupling electro, uh, electrode placing on the skin alternative current. 
they, this is the contraindication for, for electrical stimulation. Uh, if this patient have a synovial pseudoarthrosis, this will not uh, will not help. Also, electrical stimulation does not address associated problem like uh, if a patient has angulation, malrotation, and the shortening and the deformity. The evidence for using for electrostimulation there uh, regarding the pain, they uh, statistically significant improving in the pain score. But the function, no improvement with electrical stimulation, preventive and the treatment of non-union is significant greater non-union uh, with um, electrical stimulation. What about the uh, ultras, uh, ultrasonic? Ultrasonic uh, is electrical, transductic generating and acoustic pressure wave. Some evidence is to show fast healing in fresh fracture. Evidence is moderate to poor in quality with conflicted result. There is an, another modality which was called the LIPS, which is low intense pulse ultrasonography, ultrasound, layer trusted data. This is a multi center double blind randomized control indicated that uh, using open and closed tibial shaft fracture treated with intramodular nail, no difference between the group in union rate uh, and uh, SF 60 scoring, time to full weight pairing and the return to the ruby injury state. Extracorporeal shock wave therapy can be used in the management of bone healing. It's a single embus acoustic wave with high amplitude and short wavelengths. Microtrauma induced in the bone through uh, to stimulating neurovascularization and cell differentiation. Clinical studies are of poor level and do no strong evidence for using of in the non-human treatment. Now we're coming for the operative. We have three things we have to mentioned that we have three pillars. Number one, deprivement and hardware removal if you have an onion or retain. And you have surgical and fixation strategy. And then using enhancing the healing by biological stimulation. So this is the three stages and it is, has to be combined for the operative treatment. So the, the, the uh, operative treatment, the deprivement and hardware, a word removal, platelet osteosynthesis, uh, or use internodonal or extra external fixation, and this this type of biology. So surgical treatment algorithm, if you have to think about it, this non-union is infected or non-infected, there is a deformity or no deformity, provided the stability through the implant or not, added biological stimulation when necessary. So for the non-union, think about number one, First, is this an infection or non-infected? Is there is a deformity with non-union or not? And then define the biological activity and the stability of the fracture to help healing. So infected non-union, the contamination of the implant and the vitalizes implant must be removed. This is the first one. Infective infection treatment, temporary stabilization to avoid by uh, to avoid instability by external fixation, and then do capture on the specific antibiotic for the treatment with or without local antibiotic derivative like antibiotic beads. Second, the stabilization with augmentation of osteogenesis, and like cancer as one will have to maybe use. Surgical fixation strategy, it is very important when you're looking for this fracture. Define the non-union type. Is it hypertrophic or oligy or atrophic or pseudoarthrosis? The first one. Then, where is the fracture? Location of the fracture? Is it diaphysial or metaphysial? Then, think about infected or, uh, or uh, aseptic. Or, before, is there is a deformity or not? And then, look for the patient, general condition, patient and host factor, and then goal and expectation. So, you have to add it, uh, the method of adding stability after deprivement, you have to add some stability. You can use cast. External fixator, blade, or intramodular device. So the blade is stabilization. Blade provided a powerful reduction tools. Surgical technique should, uh, uh, should strive for absolute stability. Lo uh, lock the blade have improving the stability and fixation strengths. Other relative indication be like absent of modulary canal if the patient has no modulary, so it is difficult to use modular fixation. When the patient with the near the metaphysis, the metaphysian non-union need to use a plate and when over reduction or removal of period implant is required. 
Great also disease uh, helpful, uh, also very important for collection of malalignment. It can be used uh, uh, the plate. And they do, can, you can do an osteotomy, may be required, and the planning always required. Compression in, uh, in the hypertrophic uh, cases can achieve the by plate. Also, immediate mobilization, likely non weight bearing, uh, can be uh, reduced. Required adequate soft tissue coverage, very important, and there may be the advantage, the disadvantage for this plating. And the bone, uh, bone grafting are, uh, is needed. This is an example. And the plate also sees soft tissue and the bone dissection are extremely important. You have to be meticulous. Preserve the preosseum and the muscle attachment to the bone. Concept of working windows is very important. Only expose the necessary amount of the bone to do the, the cases, maintain the vascularity. Also, in osteoporotic uh, decortic, uh, osteopor osteopor decortication is very important. The management of the bone, don't uh, simply elevate the periosteum over the bone. Use a sharp chisel or osteotomy to, uh, to elevate it and osteoporotic fillet. Sharp chisel and a uh, mallet to take us uh, some uh, good vascularized bone with the periosteum provided excellent environment for the bone grafted to produce a callus formation. Intramedullary This is another type of stabilization, surgical stabilization. And here, mechanically stabilizing long bone and unit as a loot shearing implant, and they may allow for early weight pairing. Most management of mal alignment can reduce the, if the patient has a deformity. The starting and the ending point, entering and exit angle of each fragment, initially destroying the industrial blood supply, but this will be recovered in about two weeks. Nail stabilization, very important if you are looking in either case, like a femur and tibia with an existing canal, with an existing canal and the no period implant. If you have patient no without mandalary canal, this is sometimes a contraindication to use a mandalary nail. Exchange nail provided a good option for the tibia and the femur. A special equipment is often necessary to traverse the scrotting canal. Internal mandala nail can be performed without direct exposure or the section of the fracture and soft tissue envelope. Internal mandala nail dynamization can be a uh, removal of interlocking fault to allow for axial compression at the non-union with, uh, with weight bearing. This will enhance the uh, non, uh, enhanced union. Internal mandala exchange nail, replacing the internal mandala nail with large internal mandala nail increases the stability Mandala removing uh, uh, reactivated the vascularity, limited data to support this technique. What about the external fixator? Ah, oh, yes, external fixator can be used after debridement. The way you can use uh, uh, has large indication as a, is a temporary stabilization for the infection debridement. Also useful in correcting of stiff deformity and the lensing. Uh, external fixator, excellent for gradual malalignment correction if patient has non-union with malalignment, useful in, uh, in management of affected non-union, allowing for repeated debridement with stability. Also, soft tissue coverage without contamination hardware in the wound can be uh, beneficial with using of external fixator. Allowing for bone transport for a large intercalary defect can be uh, achieved by external fixator. Also can generating large compressive force at the non-union and allow mobilization of the joint to avoid the stiffness of the joint. So all paths are reasonable under clinical research. Uh, we have two things, plate and we have nail. So a plate can be replaced by plate. A nail can be replaced by nail. Also nail can be replaced by plate and the plate can be replaced by nail. So this depends on the situations and uh, the condition of the fractures. This is an example. Now we come for the, the, the uh, important things. How, how, how now we fix it, the brightness and the fix it. Now we need uh, to enhance the biology. As, as Professor Mandeep mentioned before, this is a very important steps. You have to enhance it the um, healing of the fracture because this is maybe vascular or avascular. So often unnecessary in hypertrophic cases uh, with sufficient inherited biology. 
we have many options, uh, has been mentioned, but uh, we have this uh, aspirating stem cell without or with expansion, demineralization of bone matrix, autogenous cancellous graft, growth factor, like great plate relative recommended PMP and gene therapy. So autogenous bone uh, marrow aspiration, later some transporting osteoprognated and with the primary stem cell to a non-union site, this is always osteoinductive and not osteoconductive. This, uh, they have a level three and level four study available. Positive correlation between the number of brignators, cell in aspiration and the amount of the callus formation. Also, we have steam cells, as being been mentioned in the uh, lecture before. Aspirated iliac wrist steam cells has been shown to enhance the activity of osteoconductive graft has been studied as an isolated technique with limited uh, success. What about the recommended bone morphogenic protein? This is the type of uh, uh, available in the market, BMP2 and BMP7, and uh, the name in trademark infused or OB1, uh, dem uh, demonstrated effectively in acute open tibial fracture, and it is FDA approved in acute fracture. Also comparable to autogenous uh, in the tibial non-union, the BMP7, FDA approval and uh, under HD exemptions. Uh, BMP2 for open tibial fracture, there is a pro 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 prospective and randomized study with 45 patients, resulted high dose of BM, uh, BMP2 uh, treated leading to 45 reduction in the risk of non union and radium. BMP, they have been shown to equivalent to autogenous iliac crest for delayed reconstruction of the tibial bone defect. What about the autogenous bone graft? This is uh, what is the gold, gold standard. We use it uh, um, in, in daily practice. This is also inductive containing protein and other promoting vascular and growth and healing. Osteogenic containing variable osteoplastic and mesenchymal cells, and also osteoconductive containing a scaffold for which the new bone growth can be occurred. Oste uh, osteogenous cancellous bone graft, as uh, the site it can be obtained like a posterior iliac bone crest, anterior iliac bone crest, proximal tibia, distal radius, calcaneus, and uh, olecranium. Uh, All serious suggests some instances of donor morbidity. This is a disadvantage of autogenous cancellous bone graft. Demonization bone matrix, uh, this is the osteo induction has been experimentally demonstrated and also induction ability appears variable between product, product and the donor. Constructive serial with historical control has demonstrated effectiveness in uh, humoral shaft non-union. Avoided the morbidity of the iliac crest uh, in the cases of autogenous bone graft. Reaming irrigation aspiration and bone grafting harvesting. This is a new system has been introduced by scientists, and it's comparing to the posterior and the anterior uh, iliac bone graft, the great volume that can be obtained, less operative time, no uh, difference in non-union rate, less expensive for large defect and the less donor site morbidity, this is questionable, and low, uh, more significant complication. But we have a complication, maybe uh, in this case, fracture femur can occur, eccentric creaming due to eccentric creaming or, or, or over -reaming. But In the future, now we are, uh, as mentioned in, uh, by Professor Mandeep, about stem cells, gene therapy, and the bioabsorbable structure carrier. This is, uh, in the future, what we call regenerative medicine. So in summary, uh, in summary, definition of fracture that has not and not going to heal, this is the non-union. We have four types, hypertrophic, oligohytrophic, and atrophic and pseudoarthrosis. If the bone formation but not cons uh, cons uh, consolidated, improved by the biomechanic. If no en enough bone, increases the pioneer. Assessment, very important for the host, injury, type, fracture, period treatment, and if there is infection or not. Assessment, examine, radio uh, radiography, CT, MRI, and serial marker, very important. Treatment address what is lagging. Is it biological or is it mechanical or both of them? Treatment, uh, systemic, 
pharmacological, electrical, ultrasonography, and uh, fixation. And uh, this is my reference, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Baha Karana, for this uh, very interesting presentation about a very interesting topic. Uh, I think you have discussed all the aspects of non-union, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we are waiting for any questions to Professor Karana. If we have any questions to Professor Baha. Uh, for me, sir, uh, if we have got non-union with uh, intramedial annealing, for example, uh, do you prefer to uh, reinsert another needle with a bigger size or to do plating over the needle or to use external fixator? What's your opinion, sir? This is a daily issue, as we see. First, it's infection. Uh, yes, of course. Then, of course. Uh, then uh, looking for the site of uh, the the type of the fracture, the personality of the fracture. The non-union, if diaphysia, I think it's, uh, I prefer to make a nail exchange. If uh, it is in, in the distal end or proximal end, and there is a comminution, I think uh, I prefer to do uh, fixation uh, if there is no infection and bone grafting. Or adding, like uh, the cases I'm presenting here, adding um, stability by uh, uh, putting a uh, plate all over the nail. Yeah. Another question, sir. If we got non-union in a fracture, uh, do you prefer to attack it aggressively? I mean, with another form of internal fixation and boom grafting, or you prefer to go to the biological solution and try to preserve the uh, soft tissues as you can? Look for the, uh, the, fa the, the failure. Is it biological or mechanical or post? Yeah. If it is mechanical, you have to uh, sort sorted out. You, you have to starting stability of this fracture. If it is biological, so you have to enhance it. If both of them, you have to attack uh, and thinking about fixation, stabilization, and uh, biological fixation. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Sarnivas, you are, you are raising your hand, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. The talk has been uh, uh, very educative and comprehensive. Um, thank you. Just a couple of queries, actually. I think the tibial uh, shaft fracture is the commonest place for non-union. Yeah. Uh, when do you declare that uh, uh, the fracture has gone into non-union? Is there any role for uh, cast braces in this day and age? Cast, uh, cast braces for non-union of humerus? Uh, tibia, sir. Shaft tibia. of tibia. Yeah, uh, if, if uh, this type of uh, 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 hypertrophic type I think uh, like Sarmento cast, uh, uh, it, it can be uh, helpful for the treatment of uh, this hypertrophic type. If atrophic type, I think no rules for the casting like uh, Sarmento or other method of fixation. So look for the personality of the fracture and the type of non-union. It's very important to distinguish between the four types of non-union. Hypertrophic, atrophic. This atrophic means that there is no biology need vascularity, need enhancement, need shortening, need what, what, whatever according to with gap or without gap. So it, it has to be um, um, categorized with this type of non-union. If atrophic type, uh, hypertrophic type, so you have, uh, you have vascularity, but you have instability. So you need to, to reduce, uh, reduce uh, abnormal motion at the fracture site by stabilization, uh, 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 sorry, uh, make an ostotum of the fibula, some cast, and this will be go uh, will be held for healing. Is there a period of time you wait before declaring it's a non-union for tibia? Yeah, uh, uh, according, uh, according uh, this uh, uh, the definition, it is uh, a lot of um, debate about the type of uh, non-union and the patient. I, I, I think, I think for me, uh, six months it is enough for me if uh, if I have no signs of non-union. Or sometimes, if after three months, if you have a patient with uh, with uh, no colors at all, also look for the fracture. Is it fracture open or closed? If this patient coming with an uh, extensive open fracture and no signs of healing after two or three months, I think this patient is um, a candidate for another um, surgical attacks.
Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. I think we have a couple of questions, sir. Yeah, we have two questions, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sanivas. Uh, Professor Kanana, uh, we have one question from Dr. Harris. Uh, can we mix two methods of fixation? Uh, as you said, uh, plate can be exchanged with nail. I, I think, of course, we can uh, eat plate over the nail. What do you see, sir? Yes, I, 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 I put one on one slide if you have a nail. Uh, yeah. This is nail achieve, uh, not achieving stability. You can add it like uh, in the distal, distal third of uh, the femur. This sometimes you add it by a small plating, uh, uh, control the rotation and uh, the motion, and this will help for healing. And sometimes if you have uh, uh, a short plate, you can exchange it by a longer plate, and this will help with the bone grafting. Uh, before we go to the next question, Professor Baha, uh, I want to ask you a question, sir. When do you decide to do dynamization? And when uh, do you decide to say that uh, the dynamization is not sufficient? I have to uh, augment with another form of fixation, such as plate over the knee. Look for the personality of the fracture. Is this fracture distal or there is instability yes. in the... Uh, uh, and there is abnormal motion at the, the fracture side, or the implant is improper implant, like short nail or thin nail. And I think it, the dynamization would be uh, valuable here. And I think you have to uh, think about another method of fixation. Yes, sir. Uh, the second question from Dr. Muhammad, uh, bone disease that causes delayed union or non-union. Which disease is taken in consideration in pediatric bone disease presented in fractures? Uh, th this is a big issue about uh, the bone disease, uh, which is like uh, you have some disease like osteogenesis factor. Uh, this is a uh, thinning of the bone, but it, it, it helps in healing. Uh, 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 but non-union uh, in this type of uh, like this disease, it is not uh, recorded about non-union in osteogenesis factor. But the deformity and the thinning of the cortex, this can be affected. Some diseases like um, uh, uh, malnutrition disease can be uh, uh, leading to non-union. So you have to evaluate the patient medically and, uh, and the medical condition. And this is a big subject uh, I, I, we can't mention about. But sometimes cyst, cyst sometimes when it's a fracture, it can be heal healed by itself. Sometimes it can, uh, cannot heal. So this uh, different, uh, we have to know about the type of the disease and where is it, uh, where it is, and the content of the uh, disease itself. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Baha, we have many questions because I think of the importance of this subject. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Akram has a question. After fixation of non-union tibia fracture by intramedullary renal with grafting, you prefer early mobilization and weight bearing? Yes, I, I, I prefer if I am happy about this fixation and it is rigid enough and uh, you make a locking screws in a good position and I think it, uh, you can start the partial weight pairing, a progressive weight pairing uh, protocol uh, by um, asking the patient by uh, tip two, then uh, four foot and then for, uh, full, uh, full weight pairing. And uh, this is my protocol for this patient. And also the mobilization of the joint help the prevention of the non-union. If you have a stiff joint, this will in induce sometimes uh, uh, or uh, creating some abnormal movement at the fracture site, if it's a fracture near the joint. So I think mobilization is very important, but you have to follow the protocol of partial weight pain. Yes, sir. Uh, another question from Dr. Karamani. Uh, when you uh, decide to uh, do refixation of the fracture after removal of infected implant? Yes, uh, now you, you look for the parameter of uh, this patient. Look first the baseline, uh, CPC is the first, and then ESR and C-react protein. And you are in doubt, go for more investigation, and uh, like brucacetonin, uh, 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 and if you are not, uh, you, are, you are sure there is no uh, infection, go for the second stage. Yes. Do you prefer to take a tissue biopsy, sir? 
if you are in doubt, if you are doing a debridement, they take a tissue sample. But uh, if you are in, not in doubt, you don't need. Yeah. Uh, the last question from Dr. Muhammad, the time of dynamization. Uh, this is a uh, depend about the fracture, where is the fracture and there is a callus or not the callus and uh, the uh, person itself. It is um, what we call the patient, what to compliance or non-compliant patient. Don't uh, do it for every patient. Look for the patient and uh, the behavior, educated, non-educated, um, uh, you know, the, the social clinical of this patient is very di uh, difficult to sometimes uh, can lead into a complication for you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Baha Korana. Now we come to the end of our uh, webinar. Uh, finally, I would like to thank our eminent speakers, Professor Mandeep Dillon from uh, India, Professor Baha Korana from Egypt. Many, many thanks to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sir Nives from uh, India for his great support and cooperation to complete this uh, online course between two great countries, Egypt and India. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, Ortho TV channel for live streaming the webinar to all countries of the world. And finally, many thanks to EVAC company for sponsoring this uh, webinar and this course. Uh, I will see you, uh, inshallah, uh, next Friday with another two eminent speakers from India and Egypt at 8 p.m. Uh, Egyptian time, 10.30 p.m. Uh, Indian time. Thank you so much and see you next Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you so much. Recording stopped.